it's that time of the year again, the end of one year, 2021, and the beginning of another right around the corner, 2022. Let's go ahead and gather the best games that released this year, my personal top 10 that I think you should play. Before we get started, let's establish some ground rules over the selections here. The games needed to be originally released in 2021. No HD remasters or ports are going to be on this list for those reasons. Mass Effect Trilogy was awesome. Those games are not 2021 games, though. They came out forever ago. And of course, I had to have played the games. Returnal looked cool, and I know many gamers enjoyed it. Haven't played it myself yet, though. And every year, it doesn't fail. Someone will be enraged if my opinions don't match their own. And there's usually a variation of the you're not a real gamer comment. To those people, it'll be okay. You don't have to agree with this list and you're allowed to make your own. The internet is a big place. To everyone else, sit back and enjoy my top 10 must play games of 2021. Number 10, Terminator Resistance Annihilation Line. Okay, I get it. Terminator Resistance is not a 2021 release. I'm breaking my rules already, so this one's kinda cheating, but let me explain myself. Annihilation Line is a 2021 DLC release, exclusive as of now to PC and PS5, and I usually don't include add-on content as part of a top 10 list, but as a huge Terminator fan myself, and after a full 5.5 hour stream of just the add-on content, there was enough here that I felt like a place on the top 10 list was warranted. While Terminator Resistance chronicles the final battles against Skynet in the future, Annihilation Line takes place about halfway through the campaign putting you back in the boots of resistance soldier Jacob Rivers, this time under the direct command of Kyle Reese before his trip to 1984, of course. John Connor sends Reese and his squad behind enemy lines in what seems to be a suicide mission to discover what Skynet is up to. Annihilation Line itself doesn't do much of anything different from the main campaign, it really is more of the same, but the magic of this add-on content is piecing together the story and traveling to different areas until you discover some awesome connections to the first Terminator movie that I will not spoil here. If you have Terminator Resistance on PS5 and PC, this add-on content is a no-brainer. Number 9, Far Cry 6. Far Cry 6 to me is a perfect example of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. If you've played any Ubisoft games in recent years, more specifically Far Cry, you're probably familiar with the overall formula at this point. Giant open world collectathon games, where you gradually open more of the map. Some people are bored of this formula. I am not one of these people. There's nothing really groundbreaking here, there's nothing revolutionary by today's gaming standards, but these giant sandbox games are perfect to last me a long time and I always have a reason to come back to it. On top of that, Far Cry 6 does provide an interesting setting with Gus from Breaking Bad playing an evil dictator, ruling his country with an iron fist. He always plays such a great villain and you play as a rebel freedom fighter, taking apart his empire piece by piece and it really does feel like you're having an effect on this country as you run around the map to different areas, taking now missile launching sites, burning his drug fields, and more. The arsenal of weapons available is a blast to use and experiment with, especially when you start using rocket launching backpacks and animals like Guapo the Handsome Alligator. It's so much fun just sending him into a battle and watch your enemies scream in terror as a well-dressed alligator tears them apart. It's awesome. Number 8. Resident Evil 4 VR. Okay, before you call me out in the comments, Resident Evil 4 has been re-released a billion times to be fair, which is hilarious because that GameCube cover most definitely says, only for Nintendo GameCube. That ship has sailed long ago, and I understand that Resident Evil 4 is not a 2021 release, so what's it doing on a 2021 list? Did I in fact bend the rules once again? Let me explain. Resident Evil 4 VR is not just a simple re-release of Resident Evil 4 again with better graphics. It's rebuilt from the ground up in first person view in virtual reality that creates essentially a brand new experience. Somehow they took Resident Evil 4 for the millionth time, brought it into 2021 and made it feel like a brand new game. This does not feel like classic Resident Evil 4. It's something new wearing a Resident Evil 4 skin. This is hands down the best way to play Resident Evil 4. Assuming you do have the equipment to play it, you do need access to a VR helmet that's compatible with it. Unfortunately at this time, there's no PlayStation VR version since it's an Oculus release. Hopefully over time we do get a port. What makes this version so immersive besides the obvious implementation of VR that makes you feel like you're inside the game is the gunplay. Each gun handles slightly differently and 
and behaves in a realistic manner. You can turn this feature off and have traditional weapon switching, but that's no fun. I recommend the new weapon handling mode. You want to reload a shotgun, put in the shells, and pump it after every shot. It really feels like you're holding these things. Sniper rifle, pop in your bullets, pull back, and hold the scope close to your face to zoom in. Or you could get fancy and have a gun in one hand, a knife in the other. It's awesome, especially when hordes of monsters are coming at you and you're blasting away. It can get very hectic when you're surrounded by a ton of them. You feel like John Wick in the game and in real life you look ridiculous. Definitely a must play. Number 7, Cyber Shadow. It's always cool seeing a brand new game come out in modern times that looks and feels like a game that came out in the 80s on the NES and plays well. That's Cyber Shadow, a game that looks and plays like a fusion between Strider and Ninja Gaiden, with a hint of Mega Man with its backstory, lore, and if you're watching this gameplay right here, you know exactly what kind of game this is. You play as a cyborg ninja, slaying all sorts of other machines in a futuristic setting. To be more specific, you play as Shadow, jumping and slashing his way through Mecha City on a quest to save his fellow ninja clan members from getting their powers harvested by machines. The lore in the game is surprisingly deep and the story does have some twists and turns as you progress. They can easily make more of these games and I genuinely hope we do get more because Cyber Shadow is fast paced, filled with action on almost every screen with some challenging bosses near the end, and an outstanding soundtrack. If you're into retro style gaming and think ninjas are cool, how could you not? Cyber Shadow will be right up your alley. Number 6, Halo Infinite, the Halo game that has been in development for what seems to be forever. I've loved Halo since Halo 1, and I consider myself an enormous fan of its universe and its deep lore. I really wanted to place Halo Infinite higher on the list, but certain aspects of it really kept it out of the top 5. Overall, Halo Infinite is an amazing evolution of the Halo series. Instead of a series of linear chapters, Halo Infinite has taken the series into an open world collectathon territory, and it feels refreshing. It has the feel and tone of the first Halo game, while advancing the story past Halo 5, surprisingly, taking a heavy amount of plot elements from Halo Wars 2 versus Halo 4 and 5. It has its flaws, it's got some bugs, a little rough around the edges, nothing too serious or game-breaking, but what did keep it out of the top 5 is its main storyline boss battles. Terribly designed, and they're all the same thing. A regular enemy like an elite or a brute pumped up with shields, and a health bar that takes forever to bring down, while taking place in a small enclosed environment where you can run into walls every two seconds trying to get away from them and they take you out in one or two hits. They're not fun fights, they're very tedious, and it would have been a much better game without them completely. However, putting that aside, Halo Infinite is incredibly addicting. Every time I turned the game off, I wanted to come back to it, I wanted to explore the map, I wanted to uncover more details of the story. Whether it was collecting multiplayer cosmetics, audio files that go into previous events, upgrades for the Master Chief, saving a group of Marines, or taking out a banished outpost, there was always something to do, and I do hope that the series after Infinite continues this style of gameplay. Oh, and also, the multiplayer is fun, but I like to focus on the campaign with these games, so I won't go much into that. It is fun, though. Number 5, It Takes Two. The winner of this year's Game Awards. While I haven't selected it as my personal game of the year, it truly is one of the best experiences I've had this year. High quality local couch co-op games in today's gaming environment are very few and far between with our modern day focus on online gaming. So it's fresh seeing a game like It Takes Two from the same developers as A Way Out. There's absolutely no single player mode again, only an offline or online co-op mode. Some might find that limiting, but the game was designed completely around this feature. You have to play with another person. Working together as parents turned into dolls after announcing their divorce to their daughter. Now both parents have to learn to work together and rekindle their relationship throughout different environments around their home. It's such a fantastic game to play with someone else, which I've actually been playing with my kids, bringing the social aspect of gaming back strong. And while the story has serious themes of relationships falling apart and learning to lean on each other, it also doesn't take itself too seriously at the same time. Since you're a miniaturized doll, of course you interact with things around the house that also came to life, you have to work together to take down huge bosses, and you even help a group of squirrels take back their home from evil bees, all happening inside a tree. It Takes Two is innovative, it's fun, and it's a great opportunity to hand a controller to someone else that may not be into hardcore gaming and just have a great evening together. Number 4. Ghost and Goblins Resurrection. And let me tell you something, you will be resurrecting quite frequently in this game. I'm going to start by saying this is not a game for everybody. Yes, there are difficulty levels that make the game significantly easier. But rest assured, on its higher difficulties, Ghost and Goblins Resurrection is brutal. 
and it will push you to the edge of your gaming limits on your first quest. The second quest, well, that's even harder. But that's the magic of Ghost and Goblins, isn't it? The brutal challenge is always what appealed to me when it came to this series. Arthur the Brave Knight sets out to rescue the princess and save the world from a demon army. Same story as always. But Ghost and Goblins Resurrection is Ghost and Goblins at its best providing different levels and bosses that are modern retellings of classic levels and bosses. And initially, I didn't care for the storybook style visuals, but seeing them in action is totally different than screenshots. I changed my mind once I actually played the game. It looks great, it moves smoothly, and it controls great. So you know when you die, it is 100% your fault. What drew me in over and over to this game was the satisfaction of dying a million times and slowly progressing further into a level until you've mastered it piece by piece one step at a time. That may not be someone else's definition of fun, but I love games like this that almost train you to slowly conquer it by learning where enemies will come from, how to avoid them, what upgrades to use, what weapons to have on hand. Ghost and Goblins Resurrection is a game that will drive you insane, but you'll have fun getting to that point. Number three, Metroid Dread. I almost had Metroid Dread as my game of the year. I really did. But I knew if I did that, it would be partially out of bias. I've always been a super fan of Metroid, so I knew I had to put my own love for the series aside and look at the game more critically. Let me go ahead and say that this game's outstanding in every way. It succeeded the same way that Breath of the Wild did for Zelda. It attracted gamers from everywhere, including those that aren't veterans of the series. But for old ass gamers like myself that have been playing Metroid since release, it's your typical 2D Metroid adventure in the style that Super Metroid popularized. And that's all I really desired out of it. I wasn't looking for Metroid to revolutionize the series or drastically change it like Breath of the Wild did. Dread certainly doesn't do any of that. I wanted something familiar and comfortable in a new environment, and that's exactly what Metroid Dread delivers. You explore areas, you get upgrades, fight bosses, then you explore previously locked areas, rinse repeat until the end. It's comfort food for Metroid veterans, and it's a great starting point at the same time for newcomers to introduce themselves to the series. Story-wise, Dread takes Samus to a new planet, where she's tasked with tracking down the X-Parasites from Metroid Fusion, rumored to still be alive somewhere, and we actually learn more about the details of her past and the mysterious bird-like Chozo. If you have a Switch, whether you're an existing Metroid fan or not, Dread belongs in your collection. You may just become a hardcore fan, and actually, if you'd like to know more about the lore, I am currently working on a timeline series for it. You can click right here to check that out. Number two, Resident Evil Village. Runner up to my game of the year, Resident Evil Village. Village continues the trend of what Resident Evil 7 did. It puts you into a first person shooter view, which has drawn plenty of criticism from some fans that want Resident Evil to stick with the classic third person style. Well, we still have the remakes for that, so it's nice having this alternate version of the Resident Evil universe in first person. Although this story is a follow up to Resident Evil 7, it is a very different game. Instead of mold monsters in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre style basement, we have vampires and werewolves running around an old village and castle, Castlevania style. Yes, there's a biological explanation. It's not magic, it's not supernatural. Watch my timeline series to know more. And it takes the claustrophobic small corridors of the Baker Estate in Resident Evil 7 and leaves them behind for a bigger semi-open world to explore. It's a fantastic change that also implements a weapon upgrade system and the same system that Resident Evil 3 Remake used to encourage multiple playthroughs to unlock all sorts of things. A fun mercenaries mode is back and Capcom's already promised add-on content into an already complete package, so any add-on content is surely a bonus. But Village's true accomplishment is retroactively making Resident Evil 7 a better Resident Evil game. Many criticisms, although incorrect, for Resident Evil 7 involved the story not having anything to do with the rest of the series connection-wise, and many also felt that the main character Ethan was a boring everyman. Village took his character and in one game, made him one of the best protagonists in Resident Evil lore, and it explored themes of parental love and how far a parent would go for their children. And at the same time, it uncovered secrets of Resident Evil's past that essentially brings the entire series together. Village is a well-deserved spot as the number two on my list. Only defeated by our number one, Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy is the biggest surprise of this year. It's a game that the entire internet shit on when it was first shown, as the internet tends to do. And after the incredibly disappointing, also Square developed Avengers game, my own expectations were pretty low for this. Although it's fairly lengthy, Guardians of the Galaxy is completely linear and single player only. But my god, what's in that package is almost sheer perfection. 
The developers took the Guardians of the Galaxy game and made the best Guardians of the Galaxy game they could have possibly made, with the overall feel of something between the comic books and the MCU. Instead of a basic third-person shooter, the game has surprisingly deep mechanics that require you to manage your teammates individually while at the same time managing your own gameplay as Star-Lord. Mixed with RPG elements like upgradable moves and perks, I broke everything down in much more detail with my full review on the game. I'll link that right here, I recommend you watch it. But Guardians of the Galaxy definitely pulls inspirations from some of the best games out there. You've got the dialogue, banter, and action of Uncharted, the sci-fi space exploration of Mass Effect, the humor of Marvel, and at its core, we have an amazing story that gave me the feels several times, focusing on themes of accepting and dealing with loss and exploring what motivates each Guardian to do what they do, and it all leads into a galactic level threat that the Guardians of the Galaxy have to fight against all odds. I can't properly express how much I absolutely love this game. It really needs to be experienced. Don't let the disappointment of the Avengers game preemptively influence your opinion on this one. It's totally unrelated. I proudly give Guardians of the Galaxy the status of my top number one must-play game of the year for 2021. And that's it. Till next year. I'd like to hear from you in the comments below, though. How would your top 10 list be different than mine? Are there any games you played this year that didn't make it on mine? Let me know. Metal? If you'd like to support my work, I invite you to check out my Patreon page and join as a patron. There's multiple levels of support to choose from. I'd also like to thank my current patrons and channel members that continuously support this channel. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave me a like, subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. I'll catch you guys later.